Hello, my name is Steve Brown, and I'm the worship leader at Vintage Faith Church. At Vintage Faith, we believe the Word of God is what changes and transforms a person. We hope you enjoy the next 30 to 40 minute sermon of the Word of God being proclaimed and explained. Enjoy the message. Good morning, Vintage Faith Church. Hope you're all doing well today. Um, Our scripture reading today is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. As many of you had, had given uh, and been praying for Betsy, Calabria's sister, uh, Tina. Tina had passed away this week. Um, so I want to I wanna pray for Betsy and, and Rick and, and the family. Um, and, and there definitely is a, still a financial need. And I know at one point we were using the GoFundMe uh, page, and we're, we're not using that because that is now was linked to Betsy's sister who passed. So if you want to give to that, there was a lot of travel expenses that they incurred. They're not asking for money. I had to get it out of uh, Betsy on the phone. That, that, you know, no one likes to, to be in this position, but uh, there's a need. So if you want to give to that, um, it, you, you can just make the check out to Vintage Faith like you would normally give to Vintage Faith and uh, just put for Rick and Betsy uh, on the check. Um, via GiveLify, there's no real way to, to, to do it via GiveLify, but if you give to the church, we, we will. Um, it, it's all going to wash out anyway. Um, all right, well, let, let's pray for that and them in this situation. Heavenly Father, we just lift up Betsy, we lift up Rick and the whole family in their loss that you comfort them. Lord, speak to them, speak to them by your word, through your people. Stir up the hope in them that the life to come is better than this life now. And that our hope as believers is in the life to come. If our hope was in this world only, we would be people most to be pitied. But Lord, our hope is beyond the grave. We thank you as Christians that we do not need to fear death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for those who know you. And we we just thank you um, for that hope. So we we just lift the, the Calabria family up to you, Lord. Comfort them. Show us as a church how we can help and serve them and love them in this time of loss. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, w- welcome. And um, this is the last series, our last sermon in the Made in His Image sermon series. Uh, we're we're going to be going into to Advent soon, and we've got some things planned for Advent. If you don't know what Advent is, Advent, um, it means the arrival or the coming, and it's simply... Uh, We're going to take one month as a church to just focus our minds and our hearts on Christ, on the first coming, 
but more importantly, the second coming, because that's really what, what we're waiting for. So you're going to see a, a four-week sermon series coming up starting the last week of November. Uh, it's our Advent sermon series, and it will be all about the coming of Christ first and second. Let's, uh, let me kind of back you up and, and, and rehash where we have been in this sermon series. We've established from the Bible that all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. If you can remember in Genesis 1, everything was made according to its kind, and then God kind of changes just the whole wording and everything switches, and, and it, he says, I made a male and female according to to God's kind, in God's image and likeness. Therefore, human beings have value that no other animal uh, or no other part of God's creation have. We've been talking about how this doctrine speaks to just about every crazy thing that's happening right now in our world. Life in the womb, racial tension, sexuality, gender. It speaks to, to all of it. And as Christians, we, we really want to have this robust doctrine of what it means to be made in the image of God. We looked at that one of the things, and probably the, the primary thing to be made in God's image is to be in relationship with him, rightly. It's, it's worship. We looked at Romans 1. This is what's wrong with the world. We're worshiping wrongly. We looked at how God is restoring humanity through Jesus, that he's redeeming humanity. Jesus is the true image of God, and we are to be like him, not God like him, but like him in a way. He was the image of God, the icon uh, in, in Greek. And we looked at how being made in the image of God, it means that we have this rhythm that, that we're made to, to cultivate, we're made to work. We're not made for perpetual entertainment, like the culture around us is telling us. Just be entertained, be entertained, be entertained. And we looked at, at rest that there's a Sabbath rest, that that's, God has woven that into the fabric of human beings to work and to rest. And on that day of rest, to worship. We were and are created with a purpose. Everyone in here, we looked at, you're made uniquely. You're designed uniquely no one person in here is, is quite like the other in your desires, in what motivates you, in what you're good at, in your talents. You're all different. Every one of you. A lot of times I think we assume people are like us. Oh, I, I desire this. Well, they, they would no, we're not. We even looked at how our, our maleness and our femaleness has purpose. We live in a world right now that's just trying to flatten that out, okay? Flatten that out. You, male and female, there's, there's no difference between male and female. And we looked in, in the, how the Bible says, well, there is. There's a purpose. There, your masculinity, men, has a purpose. And your feminine, femininity, women, has a purpose, and when these purposes are leaned into, the world flourishes. We looked at how Adam and Eve had a certain glory in the garden. And when they rebelled and they sinned, they lost that glory. They, they felt shame and they tried to cover themselves up. And in reality, the, the whole rest of the Bible and the story of humanity is humanity trying to cover their, their nakedness up, their, what we feel exposed to, this loss of glory. We just want to cover it up. We don't want people to see our true heart because if they saw, we'd be exposed. And we do that in, in a number of ways. I, I have a quote here I want to read from Madonna in Vanity Fair, and maybe the, the younger generation, I, I hope, knows who, who she is, although it's been, I don't know if she's popular 
anymore, but uh, my age and, and older certainly knows who, who Madonna is. But listen to this quote. And, and think about this quote in light of the loss of glory, the loss of honor, and the desire to, to cover up. She says, I have an iron will. And all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. We all know that. We all, we all have that. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. Again and again. My drive in life is from this horrible feeling of being mediocre, and that's always pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggles never ended, and it probably never will. And this is what is this other than fig leaves on the nakedness? I need people to affirm me, to, to affirm who I am. I need to show the world that I, I am, I'm worthy of honor and not shame. And, and again, this is the story of humanity. And I would just ask you this morning, can you relate to this? I, I'm, I'm sure you can. In what way in your life do you relate to this? Where are you putting fig leaves over your shame and your nakedness? We've talked about how human beings are, are misfiring since the fall. We have wills, we have emotions, we have minds, we have desires. And after that connection with God is broken, all of a sudden these things are firing wrongly. Not always wrongly, but often wrongly. Often wrongly. Our thoughts can't always be trusted. Many times we have desires within us that are straight up destructive. If we acted on them, we, we would cause destruction. Our emotions can be like a roller coaster. Me and Amy were just talking, I think it was yesterday, and I was asking her, hey, something, something's wrong, what's, what's going on? And it's just like I, I woke up and there's not even a reason like, that happens, right? You wake up, you can't even pinpoint why you're feeling miserable, but you are, and sometimes we blame others, and, and that gets messy. Our identities are confused. Who are we? We're struggling to find out who we are. We deny God and try to play God and think that we are sovereign, try to control things that we can't. This is a result of, of the fall. And this is the part of being made in God's image that's been what theologians would say, marred. Like all human beings are made in the image of likeness of God, therefore all human beings are valuable, but there is a certain part of imaging God that's just gone way wrong. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians, he's trying to, He's trying to cheer on the, the Christians at, at the church of Ephesus and just say, stop living like you used to live. Like you guys are doing all, you're in sexual immorality, you're, you're, you're in your anger, all of this. He's like, stop it. This, he go in Ephesians 4.20, that's not the way that you learned Christ, he says. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. So he, he, he kind of stops. He's like, well, you're, you're living like the Gentiles. Maybe you don't even know him. As the truth is in Jesus. And then he goes on to say, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So Paul's saying, your old self, before you knew Christ, your desires were deceitful. The prophet Jeremiah talks about that. Not to trust your own heart because the heart's deceitful. And he says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul's getting at that idea that we've been getting at in the sermon series, that you have lost a piece of the, 
of imaging God, and through Christ, it's being put back together. It's being restored. You're able to relate to creation and God rightly, not perfectly, and it's, it's a journey, but that's what's happening. And I, I would just throw this out to you. Do you. Can you say of yourself that you have new desires? New desires. Has God given you a new heart? Do you have an interest in God and in godly things? So in Christ, we understand our true purpose as human beings. In Christ, we find our true purpose in our sexuality, in our gender. In Christ, we find our true purpose in how God made you and wired you and designed you and placed you and put you in the time and place with the people you are with. And today we're going to look at, in Christ, in the church, you're given a spiritual gift and you will find purpose in using and stewarding that gift. Okay, so we're, we're in this, the, the, the last part of this sermon series has just been on purpose. Purpose in design, purpose in place, purpose in gender, and now purpose in spiritual gifting. Okay, so I, I want to draw a connection for you here from Genesis to the New Testament. <clears throat> this is called biblical theology. We're not going to get that deep, but I want to I wanna make one connection for you because it's going to be the foundation of the sermon today. Genesis 1.28, we've been talking about every sermon for the last six weeks. Genesis 1.28 is this, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we've been talking about how this is the mandate for human beings. This God took Adam and Eve and he said, go, subdue the earth, cultivate the earth. You are made to cultivate. Look at this beautiful garden. Go, multiply, fill the earth and make the rest of the earth look like this. Right? We've, we've talked about the idea that you guys, we as human beings are made to take disorder and bring order to it. That's part of what it means to be made in God's image. We are God's representatives. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20, I want you to see how this relates to Genesis. And there's a change here. All right, so this is the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. I hear pages turning, so I'll I'll wait. (laughs) Or if you want to bring it up on your phone. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors That means representatives for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So some of you may have caught how this is related to Genesis, but just to give you a few of the the connections. In Genesis, God is saying, go represent me, go out into the earth, represent me, Fill the earth, subdue it, multiply. Then we get to the New Testament. After all post-fall and and just death and all that entering the scene, Jesus comes onto the scene and begins reconciling the world to himself. And we become his representatives 
to go and multiply, fill the earth with Christians, with God's people, teaching them, preaching the gospel to them. The cultural mandate in Genesis is taking on a new meaning in the New Testament. And that meaning is go preach the gospel. Reconciliation between human beings and God needs to happen. It's only going to happen through the gospel when they hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. You and I are ambassadors. We're, that word simply means representatives with authority. I used a few weeks ago the illustration that when Amy and I go out on a date, we're in this new season where that can happen and we've been in it for a while. We tell Autumn, you are in charge. We tell the other kids, what she says goes. She has authority from us. If you talk back to her, it's like talking back to me and mom. We are giving her authority. And that's exactly what this idea of representative and ambassador is. You and I our ambassadors for Christ. We don't have authority in and of ourselves. It's given to us by God to preach the gospel to the nations. And this is the cultural mandate happening today in a spiritual way. Okay? Jesus, on the, at the Great Commission, he, he says this in Matthew 28. He's got all his disciples together. This is after his resurrection. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And again, we're going we're gonna to read this, and I want you to read it in light of just the cultural mandate. We're going and, and taking dominion for God. And Jesus came and, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here, Jesus, he's got his disciples, and, and he's giving them authority, and he's saying, go preach, go fill the earth, May represent God with God's message. This is just Genesis 128 in the New Testament, and this is what we are called to do as the church. Um, a theologian, pastor that, that I read it from time to time, Chad Bird, says this, And speaking of Christ as the final Adam, he says, This new or final Adam, once he had crushed the head of the serpent in his crucifixion, now stood alive with this group of disciples who were Israel, continued and expanded. And just as he who had all authority commissioned Adam and Eve, so now he who has been giving all, given all authority in heaven and on earth reaffirms and specifies the ancient commission. So again, the, the, the Great Commission is linked to Genesis 128, and it's linked to what it means to be a human being. It's linked to what it means to be a human being. Part of what it means to be human is to be reconciled to God and on mission with God in your life. Paul says in Ephesians 3.10 that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. Through the church. That's us. And I know that this can be really hard for us to, to kind of grasp. First of all, all we have to do is look inside our own minds and hearts and like, this is God's plan? Like, don't you have a better plan than this, God? Like, I know myself. Uh, you must have a better plan than me. And, and you're probably all thinking that with yourselves. Like, really, you look around, this is his plan, but this is God's plan, the church. 
And I think there's some problems with this because many of you in here grew up in maybe a, what I would call, high church uh, background. And that could be high church Anglicanism, high church Catholicism, high church Presbyterianism, just very uh, tradition-focused. And many of those churches at some point had lost the gospel. Not that tradition is bad, but many churches have lost the gospel. So you may be in here and have been part of a church for years, and you're like, how can this be God's plan? There's nothing happening here. Or you may just be here today and you think coming to church is just, I want to sing some music and, and hear a heartwarming message. And you fail to understand that that you are the church. This building isn't the church. You are the church. Peter says that we are a kingdom of priests. We're all priests. That just means we represent God to the world. You have a priestly duty. If you know Jesus, you represent God to the world. That starts with your family, and just that circle goes out to your friends and coworkers. In some way, however God has made you and gifted you, you are shining God's light, and you are representing him to the world. God is using you as a minister of reconciliation. And I would just ask this question to you. And to all of us, to myself too. If this is what God is doing in the world right now, reconciling the world to himself, that is the place that we're in. We're not in Eden pre-fall anymore. We're post-fall, and God's plan is through Jesus Christ, the gospel, and his people, he is going to reconcile a lost world to himself. If that is the way that God is working right now, Don't you want to be part of it? Don't you want to be part of it? And you may be thinking, well, I don't know how how I can be part of it. I don't know how I can be part of it. And we're going to look at that today. But you and I are carriers of the gospel, this message of reconciliation We all play a role in God's building a new humanity. Christopher Wright says this about the church. It is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world. As it is that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission. God's mission to reclaim, redeem, and make all things new. Do you know Jesus? I ask that question because I realize that if you don't, this has got to sound really strange to you. All of it. Do you know Jesus? If you don't, with Paul, I say, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Stop trying to play your own God, be your own God. Justify that you're a good person. The Bible straight up is going to say you are a sinner in need of repentance and you need Jesus and he died on the cross for you. And you can either spurn the cross and say, I I don't need it, or you can look at the cross, fall on your knees and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So the first question I have is, do you know Christ? And if you know Christ, and you know that he's given you new desires, and you you know that's going on in in your life, you remember at a certain time, or maybe he's working you through that now, Don't you want to be involved in building God's kingdom in his church? And the question is, if you say yes to that, is how do we find our role? How do we find our role in the kingdom? 
All right, so just like God has designed everyone in here uniquely, placed you uniquely, he's also, when you come to that point of, yes, God, you are God, I am not, Christ, you died for me, the Bible says at that point, the Spirit comes into your heart, regenerates you, actually, the Spirit first and then the repentance, but that's a whole matter for another day. But he's given you a spiritual gift as well. All of you. If you know Christ, you have a gift given by Jesus for the building up of the local church. All of you. 1 Peter 4, 10 to 11. Peter says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Each of you has received a gift. And these gifts are to be used to build the body. They're not to be used for for us on a platform and to to look good and to to get followers or to, to make us feel good about ourselves, although... When we operate in our gifts, we're going to feel good. But they're there to serve the body of Christ. And I would just ask you today, when when you think about that, and and I know from from interacting and being your pastor and and knowing some of you, you, certain people in here wake up and they think, okay, I want to serve this body, and, and, and you gravitate towards different things. Some of you like to serve, some of you want to teach. Some of you want to pray for people. Some of you just have this gift of mercy that that, that, it's uncanny. The Spirit has given gifts to the body. God doesn't make mistakes. There are gifts in this church that are building the church. And some of them you see, and some of them you don't see. Thomas Schreiner says, Spiritual gifts are not designed to help oneself but are given to serve and build up others. They are gifts of grace granted by the Holy Spirit, which are designed for the edification of the church. So if you want to discover your your spiritual gifts, the first thing that that I would just put on you, and this is something you can chew on, is when you think about wanting to to encourage the body, what do you think about? I I know what I think about preaching. I, I love preaching. I love teaching. I mean, there's other things I I like to do, but that's what gets me moving. I mean, I feel good when I'm doing it. There's other things that I I have to do as pastor of this church that wear me out, that just wear me out. But but preaching and teaching is something that, that God put in me, put in me a long time ago. I remember after coming to faith in Christ, like, why am I reading all these books? What am I going to do with all this reading? And finally, my wife is like, you're, you're, you're doing all this studying. Do something with it. And at that point, Pastor Ken had been asking me to, to teach, and I'd been running. And, and my wife graciously, graciously challenged me. And we're going to get there um, at, at the end of this. When we do know our gifts, we are to use them. Use them. That's a a call and a command from God. The hard thing when it comes to gifts and design and all of this, of who we are, is we live in, in in a culture that is, I would call it a comparison culture. Social media just takes that and explodes that. Like You can just see all types of of people doing great things, and that's not usually good for our hearts. If we can admit it, right? Like, it's not always good to see how great someone else is doing. We should be happy for them, and and often we can be, but many times, if we don't know them, and we're scrolling through Instagram, and it's like, ah, 
I'll never have that. I'll never be that. We live in this comparison culture. So when it comes to spiritual gifts, you may be tempted to look at someone else and say, I, w- I want to do what they're doing. Or I want to do it like they're doing it. Because some people can operate in their gifts and they, the Lord is using them and they're doing it very well. You can tell how this plays out for me as a, as a preacher, a pastor. Andrew and I have, have a guy that we, uh, that we love, mutually love, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And I like reading a lot of his books. Andrew's listening to a lot of his preaching. And I listen to his preaching. And he's fantastic. And the problem for me is if I was to dig in to a lot of Lloyd-Jones preaching, as you'd, every once in a while up here, you'd hear me spout out an English accent or something. Because we all have that, and you would be like, what did Anthony just do? But that's in us, right? We all have this comparison thing in us, and we can tend to want to be like other people because they're doing something good. But God made us very uniquely in so many ways And if anything, these last three weeks, I just want to push you into, he has placed you, he has made you, he has gifted you, be you. Don't be that person that you're looking at that may be inspiring you, and, and, but you're kind of leaning in saying, well, I kind of want to be like them, why am I not like them? Then you start looking at yourself and you're like, "Uh, I don't like what God's given me, and that's not, it's not good. It's not where we want to be. You are unique. You are made in his image, and he's given you all sorts of gifts and talents, but he's given you spiritual gifts to build the body of Christ. Paul says in in 1 Corinthians, he says this, for the body, this is the church here, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. And this is really that last statement. We talked about it last week. God has placed you. And we often think that, hey, I can, I, I can go anywhere. And, and to a degree, that's true. I can do anything. But God has placed you in this body. He chose. And he's done it with, an, with the idea that he, he has given the gifts that this church needs for this body. I don't have all the gifts. No one person in here has all the gifts. He's, he's made this living organism with people with different desires and gifts to be this living thing called the church that's on mission in the world. So again, I want to ask and I want to keep pressing you. If God has given spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ, what wells up in you when you think about that? How do you want to build the body, this body here? And, and I know there's people at different stages and at different involvements, and, um, and so you, you're all on a, on a journey in this, and, and you're going to be in different places. But what is God welling up in you? What gets your heart beating for the Lord in that regard? Just a brief look at how we may discover our spiritual gifts. This is... It's, it's really a whole nother sermon in, or class. But I just want to touch on, on one thing because I don't think people often look at this um, when it comes to spiritual gifts. But the, the section that Chris read in Romans is about the body and it's about spiritual gifts. And if you caught it, it starts like this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable 
and perfect. He's about to get into spiritual gifts, but he starts with obedience. Give your bodies, your whole being. This isn't just flesh, it's all of you. Give it to God. This is holy and acceptable. This is your worship. Obedience is your worship. Your mind, your body, everything, giving it to God. You want to know the will of God, he says? Be in obedience to God. I hear that from from Christians often. Like, I want to know the will of God for my life. And, And I would challenge you here if you're if you know the word and you're not living the word you're never going to know the will of god for your life you'll never know it because the will of god for your life first and foremost follow him be obedient to him yes not perfectly but follow him you want to discover your spiritual gifts be obedient so he goes on he says for the By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and individually members one of another. Hang on, backtrack. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes In generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So Paul talks about some of the gifts here. Again, it's preceded by obedience to the Lord. And he says there's there's different gifts. I've got a variety of gifts. And I don't know, as I read those, if if any get something going in your your heart. Does, Does it stir you up when you hear service or teaching or exhortation like do you like to challenge people to live the word that's exhortation generosity mercy and these aren't the only gifts paul talks in first corinthians chapter 12 i mean the and i don't even think all these lists are exhaustive but what has god put in you to build the church Pastor Matt Smithhurst says this about discovering your gifts. The best way to discover your spiritual gifts isn't to take an online test, but to fold yourself into a healthy church. Submit your life to others who can see you, know you, correct you, and affirm you. Seek first a healthy church and your gifts will be revealed to you. I hope. 100% agree with that. And there's a cost to this. There's a cost to this. You need to show up, be involved, you need to know people, you need to be known by people. That's hard, right? But the more and the longer you're in a church, the more people are going to get to know you, the more you're going to get to know people. You're like, all right, they're not quite what I thought they were. You guys are probably realizing this about me. The longer and longer I stand up here and preach, 45 minutes to 50 minutes a Sunday, I'm going to say something that's going to jostle you or maybe be wrong and, and, and forgive me. And, but that's, that's what a church is, forgiving one another, bearing with one another. But you want to find out what your gifts are, nestle into the body. Nestle into the body of Christ. But again, to nestle into the body of Christ, there's a cost. And that cost is different for all of us. What is it that you have to give up? I don't know. That's, that's different for all of you. Jesus says it like this. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Whoever would save his life will lose it. How do you lose your life as a Christian? That's the question. How do you lose your life as a Christian? It's going to be different for everyone in here. Some of you are going to be more apt to be outside of the body with mercy, evangelism, and some of you are just going to be more, you know, leaning in here, depending on what gift that you have. But to, the, to what Matt Smithhurst said, you're not going to know your gift if you're not around people. We, the men meet every uh, once, once a uh, month, and different guys are teaching, and it, it's good for me as a pastor to see, okay, yeah, that guy can teach. Huh, maybe he's got the spiritual gift of teaching. Or you're in a group of people, and someone steps up, and they're like, hey, you know what? We should pray. We should pray right now. And everyone else is like, yeah, I, did, I wish I would have thought of that. That's actually, absolutely what we should do. Well, maybe that person has the gift of prayer. Or you, you're in a group of Christians and you got the person that's like, hey, I know you're living like this, brother or sister, but the Bible actually says this, and if you follow God, your life is going to flourish. That's exhortation. Like the, God is, he's gifted his church with people and, and you all carry a gift and you want to know and find out and discover what that is. And, and I would ask you in that process, what do you need to lose or give up to discover that gift? Because you're going to find purpose when you operate in, within that gift. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and and all these things will be added to you. That's, that's what he's talking about. The kingdom through the church. All right. Wrapping up the whole sermon series here. You and I, we are made in the image of God. Utterly unique in all creation, different than anything God has made. You matter, all people matter. We as Christians have this beautiful doctrine that we can hold up to the world. God is also redeeming the fallen world through Jesus Christ and he's using you and me to do it. We are ministers of reconciliation to to move the gospel forward. The church is the lighthouse, it's the base, but we go out through the week, live our lives Preach the gospel however we do that. Serve the world, come back. You and I were made to cultivate. We're not made for entertainment. Children in here hear that you are being told from every news, social media, implicitly, explicitly, that your life is all about consuming. And you will be miserable if you listen and follow that message. You're made to cultivate. Contrary to what the world says, you're being made male or female matters. It has purpose in it. Men and women are equal, yet different. This has implications in the home. This has implications in the church. And this has implications in the wider culture. When men operate as men, how they should be, and women operate... In, in, in their femaleness as they should be, things flourish. And we're not talking about traditional gender roles. If, you, if you're going there, I'm not saying that. Although some of those things might be in that. You were made uniquely. You and I were knit together in our mother's wombs by God. That design, whoever you are, whatever you love, whatever your desires are, however, however you think your, your, your bend, it matters. It matters. Don't try to be someone else. Be who God made you to be. You don't have to look at me and say, hey, do I need to preach the gospel like Anthony? No. No, very different, very different. I, I, when I'm talking to people in the world, I don't talk like this. This is preaching. This is the church. So don't think you have to, to be like people that you see in your life. You're unique. You're also placed in this time, this place. Dig into that. Dig into that. Because we all kind of have these hearts that just 
desire, think that, that maybe there's a green hill over there that's better than this hill, better than these people, better than this life, better than this weather, right? And God is building his kingdom. He is building his kingdom. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says he will build his church. This is it. This is it. Churches like this all over the world, preaching the gospel, going out, preaching the gospel. Do you long for purpose in your life? Aren't you sick of trying to fill your life with entertainment? Comfort, control. You were made for so much more than that. I was made for so much more than that. What is the next step you need to take? Where can you surrender and take a step towards finding out who you are, who you, who you were made to be, and how you can serve God's people? As I think of Vintage Faith Church, my desire is to see a people discovering who they are in Christ, discovering their unique design, their unique gifts, their unique passions, and then operating in them. Of course, submitting to leadership and and not everyone just going off willy-nilly, but like, hey, God is going to do something here with this people, with this church, with us. Taking our energy and focusing it into God's kingdom, people, and mission. I'll leave you with this. Jesus said to his disciples, he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is what God's doing in the world right now. We can either enter into it or we can stand on the sidelines, watch other people do it. Heavenly Father, you are the the Lord of the harvest. Lord, you say we are your workmanship. We desire to do your work. Not for salvation, that is free free to us, costly to you. Lord, you you say in your word you've created our works beforehand. You say in Psalm 139 that all our days were written beforehand. Lord, you have made us for this day, this time and place. And this time and place and this day is made for us. Lord, we long individually for purpose. I know some of us in here need to be shaken out of our purposeless lives. Some in here are chasing entertainment and experience and comfort. We're making our lives small by trying to control our lives and not trusting in you. And I know others in here, Lord, are eager to discover their gifts and and just not quite sure. For those people, Lord, just comfort them and, and help them to wait on you. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who brings all things about in the fullness of time. Help us to be a people like Isaiah when you said to him, Who shall I send? And he said, Here I am. Send me. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Vintage Faith Podcast. At Vintage Faith, our vision is to help people who are far from God to become totally devoted followers of Jesus. We pray that this podcast brought you closer to God. For more information, check us out at VintageFaithCicero.com.